Okay, so starting over, uh, lock and amplifiers. Uh, very basically, lock and amplifier is a piece of laboratory electronics that's meant for making narrow band AC measurements, often uh, small signal measurements in the presence of a lot of noise. Uh, very roughly, you could think of it as, a, as an alternate to having a very high Q filter. Uh, you actually get a lot more than that, and I'm gonna talk much more about it in detail, but I wanted to orient you especially if you haven't used a lock amplifier, what they're for. Uh, so it's for making narrow band AC measurements. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about lock-ins and their history. There's a couple of old papers I wanted just to show you. Um, go over the terminology that gets used with lock-ins and settings. We'll spend a little bit of time on how to set time constants and output filters, what phase means in a lock and amplifier, a little bit of looking at lock-ins and the signal recovery with lock-ins in the frequency domain, uh, a small collection of common mistakes. Um, there's a wide range of uncommon mistakes. It's actually, there's a <coughs> it, it's, uh, it's remarkable how, how many ways people can go wrong, but I've highlighted some of the most common ones that I've encountered, and then a couple of advanced topics. Um, and I, I haven't seen what we're gonna be doing in the practicals this afternoon, but I'm, I'm sticking around for the next couple of days and we'll be in the lock-in practical lab. So any questions you don't get a chance to ask me now here about lock-ins, we can go over in the, the practical. Okay, so this paper from 1941 is the oldest example I know of in the literature that actually calls something a lock-in amplifier. Uh, and this is ri written by this professor, Michaels, and one of his students from Bryn Mawr in 1941. It actually cites an older paper by this guy, Cosens, who describes a technique, but doesn't use the term lock and amplifier yet. <coughs> the main reason that I want to show this paper is to point out that it actually is published before this paper. And this paper is commonly credited with the invention of the lock and amplifier. Uh, this was published first in 1945 as an internal Rad Lab note at MIT, and then later appeared in Review of Scientific Instruments the next year, it's by Robert Dickey from Princeton, uh, <coughs> who uh, certainly popularized the locking technique with this paper. Um, <coughs> this paper also describes the invention of something called the Dickey radiometer, which is what's diagrammed here. Uh, if we get a chance, I'll go come back to this slide to show how this is a diagram of a lock and amplifier here running at 30 hertz detecting black body radiation. I'm also gonna talk about this same paper again in the next talk, uh, which has very nice treatment of the connection between Johnson noise and black body radiation. Okay, and this paper was pointed out to me just at this last year's APS conference a few months ago. Um, and this is an example of serendipity in the universe. Uh, <coughs> so this is uh, written by a group from University of Pittsburgh uh, in Professor Singh's group. They study, uh, they do research in the education of physicists. And this paper is on common misunderstandings of new graduate students and how they use lock and amplifier. It, it was like a gift to me in, in preparing for this talk. Um, and so some of these themes here are what guided me in, <coughs> in preparing the rest of the material for this morning. So what is a lock and amplifier? I said I was gonna come back to this question. So this is boiled down to its most simple, the block diagram of what's, an, what's necessary to make a lock and amplifier. The, the real key is this little circle with a square in it, with an X in it. Uh, that's labeled a phase sensitive detector. It <coughs> also could be called a mixer or a multiplier. And <coughs> this, this is the whole core of a lock and amplifier. And the other key ingredient is some local oscillator that's normally a sine wave on older lock ins, it might be a square wave oscillator. And then a preamp, which this is where your small signal will come in. And this could be an arbitrarily small signal, microvolts, nanovolts, RMF at some frequency. And you arrange this local oscillator either internally or through an external reference in a phase lock loop to be at the same frequency that you're trying to recover. You then mix them together in, the, in this mixer and through some trigonometry, you'll see that the, this is a way to frequency shift the measurement you're trying to make down to DC. A low pass filter will filter out other artifacts. There's some additional gain and then an output. There's also usually a sign out that's synchronous with the, the phase lock loop or the local oscillator that can be used to excite your experiment. And we'll fill this in more in a, just a moment. This is also an example of what a lock and amplifier is. Uh, 
the, this is not the oldest product. This is probably the most long-lived product in Lockheed. This is the PAR 124A. Uh, I think it was introduced into the market in the mid-70s. It was last manufactured in 1979. I think there's still a fair number of them here in use. Uh, these are some of the Lockheed amplifiers from SRS. This is one from a Japanese company, NF Corporation, uh, Signal Recovery, which, used to, which is the successor to PAR. And the newest entry into the field is Zurich Instruments. So this is a more complete diagram of a lock and amplifier. I've added now a second phase, and we'll talk a little bit about what it means to have two phases in a lock and amplifier. If you have only a single phase lock in, this second path here is missing. Um, uh, user phase shifts get added there. Okay, so. This is the only page filled with math that I'm going to show you. Um, <coughs> the, this is, this is uh, eighth grade or high school trigonometry. It's just the product of, of two sines or sine and cosine. And I only show it to you to remind you that you get a difference term and a sum term. So if you have some input signal, which is going to be at some frequency f signal and some phase, and then we have the reference oscillator that we uh, just created, which is going to be at some reference frequency. And we may have two of them, one shifted by 90 degrees. The output of those PSDs is just going to be this multiplication factor. This is the, the mixer. And then you get these two long-looking expressions. This term here is the DQ term. And we call it that because that's where you have the difference of the frequencies. Then this, this term is usually called the 2F term, where we add these together. You can see where this is called DC or this is called 2F when the signal frequency and the reference frequency are equal to each other. Um, also, you notice that the DC term contains, beyond the, the time dependence, the difference in phase between the signal phase and the reference phase. And <coughs> just if you're not used to the, the trigonometry, I just want to sh run through what the waveforms would look like. This is just some arbitrary input sine wave the lock-in reference oscillator at zero degrees. This is the output of the PSD. You can see that it looks like a sine wave at twice the frequency. It's also offset. That's the DC term. And as we go marching through the phase, you can see now if I've shifted by 90 degrees, the DC term here has gone to zero. Also, the 2F term is advancing in phase. And you can just go walking through all of the phase Okay, so the trigonometry I pointed to just a second ago, the phase that is measured by a lock and amplifier is this difference, the difference between the phase of your signal and the phase of the reference. We'll just call that theta now. And if the, these frequency areas are identical so that the time dependence of the DC term drops out, then the X and Y outputs just have cosine theta and sine theta. And then this is the familiar form of the outputs of a lock and amplifier. So the R term, which comes from radius, is just the amplitude of the signal that's being detected. And so X and Y and R and theta are related by these, these two relationships. X and Y are the, the direct outputs of the phase sensitive detectors. R and theta are drive quantities. OK, so coming back to this block diagram again, the the functions here, when you set the phase setting on a lock and amplifier, so this is, and I'll show you where that is a little later in the talk, when you adjust the phase, you're adjusting a phase shift here that's going to shift the phase coming from the reference oscillator into the phase sensitive detector. The phase setting is not the same as the phase measurement here, which, if I can go back, yeah, is this difference. Uh, the DC filter is controlled by a parameter called the time constant. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. And then finally, there's some, some output, which is often numerical, but could also be just analog. And in, a, in an analog lock-in, this is just analog. So why use a lock-in amplifier? The, the next talk is going to help motivate this more, but often, all, not often, probably universally, systems will exhibit some higher noise at, at low frequencies. At low enough frequency, you'll always run into some sort of a 1 over F effect. This is the voltage noise from one of our preamps. If you're trying to measure something that's relatively slow, 
ideally you figure out a way to modulate your signal so that instead of running down here at two or three hertz where the noise of the amplifier is very high, you figure out a way to get up above 100 hertz or maybe a kilohertz or so where you're at a better noise environment for the amplifiers. Lock-ins are also useful in challenging signal-to-noise environments. And finally, if you need to make phase-sensitive measurements, lock-ins are a great tool for that. Okay, this is now, I'm gonna use the SR830 for most of this section. This is a pretty common lock-in amplifier. Other lock-ins have similar controls. But I'm gonna go over just some of the basic settings. Uh, this is just how, when you walk up to a lock-in amplifier, how, how to adjust it. So the first parameter is sensitivity. On the A30, it's this section right here. Sensitivity is the control of the gain. And uh, I always think of it just as gain, but um, it's inverse gain. And it corresponds to the RMS amplitude detected at the frequency you're locking to that would give you a full scale signal. That's the sensitivity. It's similar to the sensitivity setting on an oscilloscope. Um, so as an example, if you have a sensitivity set to 500 nanovolts, and the lock-in full scale is 10 volts output. Uh, if you have an input signal that's 200 nanovolt, and I'll point out RMS units are what lock-ins are traditionally calibrated to. So there's a square root of root two compared to the amplitude. So if you have a 200 nanovolt RMS input signal, then the output amplitude that you'd see over here would be this 200 nanovolts divided by the sensitivity, 500 nanovolts, so 40% of full scale times 10 volts, or four, four volt DC output. Time constants. So on the 830, that's this section. Okay, well, <coughs> that's an unfortunate line wrap, but I think we still figure it out. Um, the time constant uh, for is the control of a simple low pass filter. And on traditional lock ins, that just looks like a single pole of RC. And then you could add between one and four poles of RC in series. So the frequency response of, of this filter is uh, in, the, in the stop band out past the, the corner frequency, just asymptotes to one over F to the N, where N is the, the number of poles, uh, one, two, three, or four poles. This is a common source of confusion. What frequency are we talking about with the lock and amplifier? This is applying to the frequency of the signal that comes out of the phase sensitive detector. So this is not the frequency that you've tuned the lock and amplifier to. Um, this is, mm, that's really unfortunate. Uh, <coughs> it's the frequency of the phase sensitive detector, uh, the, the output of the phase sensitive detector. So if your signal has a settling time of a second or two, then you may want to set the time constant to 10 seconds. And you can do that even if your lock in is running at a kilohertz. Dynamic reserve, let's see if this one goes better. Oh, it's looking better. So dynamic reserve is probably the most confusing parameter on a lock-in. Uh, sensitivity, remember, described the overall gain, just from, the, from input to output. Dynamic reserve sets a policy for how to allocate that gain between the AC and DC stages of a lock-in. And this is a diagram from an analog lock-in amplifier where dynamic reserve is really the, uh, a critical parameter you could think of the overall gain as being divided between some AC gain and a DC gain stage, and they just multiply together to give you the overall sensitivity. The reason why you may want to have more gain pushed over to the DC side, which would be high dynamic reserve, is if you have a lot of additional interfering signals that are at, um, that are at frequencies away from your detection. If you had too much gain up front, you may saturate the amplifier. You can rely on the mixer and the low pass filter to remove those out of band large interferences before you add this DC gain. So you get the best dynamic reserve or the best um, rejection of out of band signals if you set the reserve to high reserve. The problem with that is now you're adding a lot of your gain in this DC stage where the problems that where these problems come back in to haunt you. So you have the problems of DC stability and drift in that, in this amplifier. So for the lowest noise performance, you'd change the allocation policy to add as much gain as possible here, where you're taking advantage of the 
lower noise AC performance of the amplifiers, and lower gain here at DC. So for digital lock-in amplifiers, this is really a nominal control. There is no DC gain. That's all done digitally. But there is still AC gain before the analog to digital converters. On the newest amplifiers we've made, we've uh, gotten away from calling this parameter dynamic reserve, and now we call it just input range. So input range is separate from input sensitivity. The range is just the hardware range of where the amplifiers will saturate, as opposed to sensitivity, which is the full scale gain. Yes? Oh, so in, uh, in terms of reserve, so on the older lock-ins, if you press this button, it just cycles through high reserve, normal, and low noise. High reserve is most of the gain at DC, and low noise is most of the gain at AC. Uh, to make a high reserve setting on the H65, you choose a range up at around 300 millivolts or one volt. To do the low noise settings, you'd go down to 30 millivolt or 10 millivolt full scale. Okay, offset um, is not complicated, but it's easy to get a little twisted around by which way it goes. It operates on X, Y, and R. There is no offset for theta. Uh, it's expressed as percentage of full scale. On the A30, these controls down here control turning the offset on and off uh, and adjusting it or doing auto offset, auto offset on a signal will cancel that particular signal. Um, uh, so it'll set the offset equal to the current measurement. Uh, the other thing I should mention is offset is often used together with the, this last parameter I'm going to describe, which is expand, which just adds an extra factor of 10 or 100 in gain to the output. And so the expand comes after the offset. And so the, the final transfer function that describes the signal you'll see here at these BMCs will be the input signal, the detected signal, divided by the sensitivity, minus the offset as a percentage, times the expand factor, which is 1, 10, or 100, then times the full-scale output. Okay, reference section. Here are a few reference sections on the lock-in. It's traditional that the reference section is as far from as possible from the input section of a lock-in. And that's actually by design. The thing you're trying to avoid when you, when you build a lock-in amplifier is coherent pickup. You'd like to not detect yourself. Uh, you're trying to detect sometimes nanovolt level signals, and you may have a one volt sine wave at exactly the frequency you're trying to detect. So we keep those sections of the instrument as far apart as possible. The input's usually on the left. The reference section is on the right. Um, so th there's two basic modes to the reference section. Uh, input, uh, internal and external. Internal means you're just running the lock-in as a standalone oscillator. And that then sources your experiment. In external mode, it means you have some external reference. You're going to have the lock-in amplifier track some other oscillator. That could be a chopper wheel if you're doing a modulated laser experiment. It could be a function generator. It could be another lock-in amplifier. Uh, the frequency, so it's often confusing to understand which settings affect what part of the reference section in a lock-in. So frequency is a control when you're in internal mode and will set the frequency of the oscillator. When you're in external mode, the frequency is just a monitor. It'll show you the frequency it's running at, but you can't set the external frequency from the lock-in because it's tracking. Uh, the amplitude controls the amplitude only of the sine output. And this is another area where people sometimes get confused. That has no effect on the internal sine wave that goes to the mixer. So the PSD always gets a unity sine wave. Uh, the amplitude control just uh, affects the sine output. This is another area where people get confused. The phase control only shifts the phase of the oscillator going to the phase sensitive detector. So the phase control does not introduce any phase shift between reference in and sine out. Sine out always is just tracking the master oscillator. The phase shift is introducing a phase shift to the PSD. The harmonic control, uh, and I'm not going to say a lot about harmonics, but you can lock a harmonic, uh, you can use a lock and amplifier to detect the second or third or 17th harmonic of your reference signal, uh, and that'll multiply the sine wave going to the mixers. It does not multiply the sine wave coming at the output. So if you're running on the third harmonic on an SR830, the sine wave output is still at the fundamental. Now there's a little asterisk here because on analog lock-ins, 
we don't have the luxury of having lots of parallel numerical oscillators. There's only one analog oscillator. So on the SR-124 or on a PAR-124, if you set this to 2F or 3F mode, the sine wave is actually at that frequency. Then finally, DC level out, some of the newer lock-ins we've uh, come out with, ha give you the ability to add a bias voltage to the output. That only shows up on the sine wave output. You don't add a DC bias to the mixer. Um, and then when you're running in external mode, the reference input signal, which is here on the A30, or here on the A65, or here on the SR124, uh, it could, when it's set to sine mode, it's AC coupled. And in sine mode, it always locks to the rising edge of the signal. And so it's important to realize, and I'll come to that a little bit later, it's not trying to lock to the fundamental. It's just looking at the rising edge of the zero crossing after AC coupling. Then TTL could be set to rising or falling edge uh, on the 830 and the 865. On the 124, the TTL mode is only rising edge. Uh, and watch out for unlock. Okay, a little bit of talk about the time constant and output filter. Uh, and these next few slides are gonna focus on some of the new abilities that the newest lock-in amplifiers have. Uh, for us, this would be our SR-865 lock-in. Uh, I think the newest lock-ins from Signal Recovery and Zurich also have the ability to have more advanced numerical filters. Uh, these are FIR filters, as opposed to your classic RC one-pole exponential response filter. Um, and this is showing the response in the frequency domain of the two-pole classic filter, and this is set for one second time constant. And then also the advanced filter, which in the case of the SR-865 is a, is a Gaussian FIR filter. Um, the, what you get with the advanced filters is more bandwidth and better out-of-band rejection at the same time. Uh, this is a linear sweep of frequency uh, going from uh, minus five to plus five uh, FCs on a one second time constant. And you can see a little bit that you get a wider acceptance of frequency, but then when you get out to maybe half a hertz off of the carrier, uh, you have much better rejection. That corresponds to, to this big difference between the Gaussian filters and the RC filters. In the time domain, uh, and I wanted to focus on this plot a little bit to remind you what we're looking at in the output of a lock-in as opposed to the input of a lock-in. What's down here in the bottom on these scope traces is the input to a lock-in at a kilohertz. Uh, might be three or four kilohertz, I don't remember. This is about, a, I think it was a three millivolt input, then stepping to a 10 millivolt input. So the, the amplitude of the input signal went up thir uh, a factor of three. This is the response of the output. So this is uh, taking a, a classic one pole response, and it's on the output of the lock and amplifier. So this, this filter isn't trying to do any filtering of this several kilohertz signal, it's filtering the output of the PSD. Um, and this should be familiar, so it's a single pole RC response. This shows what you can get with one of these advanced filters. This is just a one pole Gaussian filter. There's a little bit of lag at the beginning compared to the RC filter starts responding immediately, but it settles faster and after a finite period of time it's completely settled, whereas the RC filter is continually exponentially approaching the final value. So you can get faster settling on changes with a Gaussian filter. And then here's the four pole version of the same two filters. Okay, so 2F and Ripple. So here's a, an example of running now at a lower frequency. The lock-in is set to 13.1 Hertz. Uh, low frequencies are often used in low temperature experiments if you're doing transport where you have to go through wiring to the bottom of your cryostat. There may be Pi filters that have big capacitors on them, so you're always worried about phase shifts. So you may not be able to run at kilohertz or 10 kilohertz expectations. Uh, you're often running down at, at these sort of low frequencies where you go as low as possible while still staying above the one over F noise of your electronics. And here's an example of just a step response where we have the lock-in set for a one second time constant and we have two pole or 12 dB per octave. Um, this is where the, the input first takes its step down, and here's the response of the lock-in. But you notice these signals are really fuzzy. This is the Y channel, this is the X channel. And what that fuzz is, if you zoom in, is the 2F component. This is the 26.2 hertz leaking through the filter. Uh, 
uh, it's not very big. Uh, this is down at the um, three or four microvolt level, but it's still it's still there, and you could do a lot better. How how the what are the things you can do while still recovering your signal? If you can increase the filter order, this goes to four poles instead of two poles. This is, you can do this on any lock-in today. You could use the 30. You could use um, Fifty-five. Just increase the order of the filter. Still, one second time constant. The two F ripple is gone, but you notice there's a lot more lag here before the filter starts to respond, and your final settling time is is longer too. So that'll work, but it's slower. Uh, you could use an advanced filter like that Gaussian filter. Uh, so this is a Gaussian filter with the same time time constant and slope as the RC filter. It doesn't start responding quite as fast as the RC, but it's settled much faster. And again, the, that out-of-band rejection is a lot higher, so the 2F is also uh, eliminated. And then finally, and I have to, this asterisk is uh, at Scott Hannes' request, but I'd be sure to, to point this out. Uh, you could use a synchronous filter. And the A30 has this, the A65 has this, the other lock-ins have it. A synchronous filter is a digital filter that puts an exact notch at the frequency of the excitation. So this is, I said, remember, th these time constants all have to do with the output of the PSD, but the sync filter is looking at the excitation frequency and is going to try to notch F and 2F and all the other harmonics of F. Problem with using the sync filter on the SRE30 is it's buggy, and so you'll occasionally have bumps in the output that don't correspond to your signal. So it's probably better not to use that. Those bugs have been fixed in the 865. This is a trace of the signal coming out of the 865 running the same just two pole filter you get the fast response time of the original filter all the ripples is, is nulled by the digital sync filter okay I'm, this is the last thing I'm going to come back to phase <coughs> and I wanted to just go over what the, the phase convention is on, on a lock and amplifier um, and it comes from from this form of the equation. Th this is what the 830 and the 865 all implement in terms of how phase is defined. There's a diagram in the manual of the 830 that has this drawn backwards. The equations are right, all the words are right, but the diagram is drawn backwards. Th this is how phase is defined, and I'm defining it relative to a square wave external reference input. So you know, time, you have to choose some point for when time's going to start. I'm going to choose it to correspond to the rising edge of the TPL input. This parameter here, state of reference, is the phase setting of your locking amplifier. And then this phase here is the phase of your signal. And both of them correspond to a leading phase relative to the external reference. I think I mentioned this before, but when you adjust the phase setting on your locking amplifier here, it has no effect on the sine wave that comes out there. That phase adjust is adjusting this box here, the user phase setting, which is phase shifting your, from your oscillator up to the mixer. Finally, there's an auto phase function that all the digital lock-ins have. Actually, the SR124 has this as well. When you press this button, that tells the lock-in amplifier to go and adjust the phase setting of the reference to line it up with the phase setting of the signal. And so equivalently, that adjusts the lock and amplifier to make the X signal equal to R and Y goes to zero. And uh, it does that one time. So each time you press auto phase, it's an event. The lock and amplifier will go measure the phase and then adjust it to zero. It doesn't, it's not a tracking mode. Yeah. Oh. Uh, so, what you would look for is to see X go to some positive value and Y go to zero. Uh, now, if your signal is changing, um, that may, so especially if the phase shift of your signal is changing, when you press auto phase, and there's a time constant response to that, when you, when you press auto phase, it'll make this adjustment right away to the inputs to the PSD but then the output time constant filter still have to settle. So there'll be a several time constant settling time while you see Y go to zero and X go to full scale. But if your phase is changing live, uh, 
after it settles, it may not be at zero again. It may be continuing to walk away from you. It depends on the rates at which things are changing in your experiment. Does that make, make sense? When y goes to z when y goes to zero and x is positive, that that's the condition for this being satisfied. Okay, so I'm going to take a few slides to talk about what a lock and amplifier looks like in the frequency domain, and I'm going to make up a s an experiment where we have a signal at 421 hertz. It's going to have a microvolt amplitude. <coughs> We're going to add some one of ref noise and some power line uh, pickup at F two F and three F, and so this is this is my input spectrum. So this is if you put a spectrum analyzer on the A input of lock in in this this case, this is what we're going to see. There's some noise going out. Here's my signal, and it's not perfectly narrow because the signal is changing a little bit. I want to be able to preserve that signal bandwidth. Uh, there's one of ref knee that's going up towards DC. Here's my power line input, and we're going to set the lock in amplifier to to be right at this frequency, that 421 hertz. And then this is what the spectrum looks like at the immediately on the output of the phase sensitive detector. And this is for a sine wave lock-in. All, all the digital lock-ins do this. It's a different situation for an analog lock-in like the 124, which uses a square wave multiplier. But for a, for a sine wave multiplier, what comes out of the PSD, here's the 1 over F curve that we had at the input. DC, what had been DC at the input shows up now at the frequency that the lock-in is locking at, 421 hertz. This point out here is the 2F image of our input, and the original input signal is now up here. Here's where our, uh, this is our 60 hertz line, 120 hertz line, and 180 hertz line. Now we can apply an output filter and start filtering out all this other stuff. You see even, so a one millisecond filter with two poles does a really good job of killing the 2F component, but there's a lot of noise from the DC that was coupling in that will show up at 1F. So we need probably more, more filtering. This, this is still going to be a higher amplitude than, uh, than the signal we're trying to recover. So we could add another, another two poles of filter, maybe we increase the time constant. Now to 10 milliseconds. Now we've got over uh, almost 40 dB of signal to noise on the signal we're trying to recover. Uh, and th this is probably a good setting for that experiment. Okay, so um, actually, before I go on to common mistakes, did everyone understand that frequency domain look? Oh, yeah. So <coughs> if, if the lock and amplifier was being perfect, you wouldn't see any change to this by changing the dynamic reserve. What you may see, though, when you change the dynamic reserve is that there will be more noise in your output here uh, if, if you increase the dynamic reserve, so you add more DC gain. Uh, then the detection here will get noisier because you didn't have as much gain. Let me come back. To the uh, yeah to here. When you're at a low reserve setting, this low frequency noise can be higher. Uh, no, I'm sorry. When you're at a when you're at a there. When you're at a low low high reserve, so low AC gain. So this is a spectrum after you've multiplied, and you're adding more of the gain here at the DC stage, so there's going to be more noise or drift from that DC stage here. Does that yeah. make Okay. Okay. So common mistakes. Uh, first one is just forgetting to look over at how the input is, is set up. And this, these all seem, many of these just seem trivial. Uh, most people have spent hours on these mistakes. And so if I could just give you a checklist to remember to look at, I hope to save you some of that precious magnet time. 
Uh, so first, make sure if you're set, if you're trying to measure differential signal, did you really set it to A minus B and it's not still on A? If you have a significant DC signal, make sure you're AC coupled and not uh, not DC coupled. And then I didn't even talk about the current inputs. Uh, yes. Yeah. Oh, AC. Yeah. So the um, if your signal has a big DC offset on top of the AC, uh, the lock-in amplifiers, if you run the lock-in in a DC coupled way, that DC offset will go through the mixer and generate a really big component at one time, the frequency, at one F. So the same way that the, the mixer generates a two F term, you'll get a one F term from any DC offset here at the input. So if you, especially if you have a significant off, like if you have a, a voltage DC bias on a microvolt signal, you pretty much have to AC couple. So you want to block that DC signal. Um, the risk is if you're running at very low frequencies, even the 13 hertz example I showed you, you're now not so far into the high pass range of the AC coupling that you're not sensitive to being on the slope of the response function. So if your frequency isn't really stable and you're running at 13 hertz and you're AC coupled, there may be some additional gain variation as your frequency might wander a little bit on the AC response function. So AC or DC coupling, current input, which I haven't talked about at all. If you need to measure current, you can use the current input on a lock and amplifier, but you probably shouldn't. Uh, and the reason that you shouldn't is uh, current amplifiers almost always suffer if you have any significant cabling between your, your signal source and the amplifier itself. Uh, that adds input capacitance, which spoils a measurement. Unless you can arrange to have your lock and amplifier very close to your sample, you should probably have a current free amplifier whose outputs are always voltages. So, I'm but if you have the lock and set to current and you don't expect to be measuring current, nothing's gonna make sense. So make sure that one of these two lights isn't lit, but you're set to A or A minus B. So overload. Um, if you remember, actually, there's lots of different gain stages in a lock and amplifier. If any one of them saturates, you don't have an answer. But you may not see the output get pegged to full scale either. If the AC amplifier saturated, nothing will come out of the mixer. So there's there are a bunch of different overload lights on a lock and amplifier, and you need to kind of scan them all. Generally, the one by the display will be the the logical OR of all of the lock, or all of the the overload. But an overload here tells you that the input amplifier overloaded. Uh, an overload here tells you that the full scale output is uh, overloading. An overload here tells you that the output of the mixer was saturating uh, the input to the time constant filter. Okay, this is probably the most classic mistake if you are using a lock and amplifier that someone else has used. Um, uh, everything's set up, you expect to be seeing something, there's nothing there. Or there's a little bit of something there, but it's much too small. And you check your cables, you check your amplifier, you check your batteries, and then an hour later you go and look, oh, it's measuring the third harmonic. So uh, just take, uh, and that's over here in the reference section. Uh, on the SR830, I think the harmonic LED actually blinks when you're not displaying a harmonic to help remind you, hey, you're not on the fundamental. So if, if the harmonic is set to anything other than one, uh, then you may not be seeing what you're expecting to see. So just, just check for that. Unlocked, uh, if you're using an external reference, um, there's a little light here that'll tell you that we're not tracking the, the signal anymore. There's still an output to the lock-in, but it's not what you're trying to measure. So if you're unlocked, you have to figure out what's gone wrong and, and troubleshoot that. And then poor choice of time constants. Um, and this is just one that I've made. Uh, you probably meant to have 100 milliseconds, not 100 seconds. Uh, uh, you can set lock-ins to very, very long time constants. I don't know why. That we, you could set it to a 30,000 second time constant. Um, and unless you're doing seismology, I don't know where that would be useful other than that you can do it. And so, so before I ever got to SRS, digital lock-ins implemented these very long time constants. Uh, the only time that I know that they've ever been used is when we've tested that they work. I don't know that anyone's ever actually done it, but you can set a time constant where you won't see anything changing on the output. And that's uh, just go back and check there. Also. Uh, may, if you're seeing rippling, 
uh, from 2f, maybe you have to adjust the time constant for that. So other possible sources of problems. So this first one uh, comes from a, a paper that came out, I think this is from uh, the Goldhopper Gordon Group, uh, published this paper looking at the effect of input impedance on the amplifier on a 2D electron gas measurement uh, or it was obviously on, on the, a Hall probe. The, and they went through looking at, at these amplifiers in particular, even though these preamplifiers uh, are high impedance at 100 mega ohm, they do rob some of the current out of this circuit. Uh, so be aware of the effect of input impedance. The one that I wanted to concentrate on a little bit is about input capacitance. Uh, a lot of times there'll be capacitive loading on a circuit, and if you're trying to measure it at AC, the effect of the capacitance, uh, if, you're, if, the, uh, if you're starting to lose signal due to capacitive losses, you'll see things scaling with F. So a good way to check that you're not in that realm is to change the frequency of your experiment. Uh, so if you are trying to measure AC resistance and you're running at 13 hertz and you think that that should be far removed from all of your filter frequencies, try moving it up to 17 hertz or 22 hertz and make sure that you get the same answers. If you see something that's starting to fall off the frequency, either your filters are too aggressive um, or you need to run at a lower frequency. Okay, so noisy or, or spurious references. So I mentioned that, so I, I created a, a really awful looking input to the external reference for this example. Um, this is, so we're trying to lock to this lower frequency sine wave and I added a high frequency thing on top of it. In this case, the, uh, the sign, uh, the lock-in didn't lock and it, the unlock indicator lit up, you know there's a problem and if you've got an oscilloscope out, you see, oh, I, that's awful. And remember the lock-in is looking at the zero crossing to the sine wave. Um, so you can see here there's a zero crossing there and then another one there, one there and there. So it's, it's not periodic. It's just, uh, it's impossible to lock. But you could have levels of noise that don't lead to an unlock but still lead to really awful performance. And if I'm showing here and here, I've just turned down the high frequency component. The lock-in was actually able to lock to these but what I'm plotting down here is the frequency, the external frequency that we're tracking. This is supposed to be a 200 hertz signal or 204 hertz. Uh, but again, that, that noise is modulating where the zero crossings are happening. And so here we're getting this awful nine hertz peak to peak envelope in the tracking frequency. I could turn the noise down and the frequency gets more stable. If you have a really clean sine wave, the lock-in should be able to recover that frequency at a even better, this is 35 millihertz noise range. Uh, there's another lesson here though about the lock range, uh, especially at lower frequencies. If you're running at anything under a few hundred hertz and you have a TTL reference available, the lock-in will do a better job of locking to that TTL reference than to a sine wave reference. Uh, even here, uh, where there's just not that much slew rate at the zero crossing compared to with a, a square wave. So if your frequency is below, say, a kilohertz, you'll probably get better phase noise if that is relevant uh, to uh, if you use the TTL input mode instead of the sine wave input mode. Okay, so I'm gonna just very briefly talk about uh, analog lock-ins. Uh, so this is a new analog lock-in. It's modeled on the old PAR-124. A few of the things that are different from most of what I said, the mixer here multiplies not by a sine wave but by a square wave. And that means that all the odd harmonics of your input signal will come out in the output. Uh, the uh, it also adds one additional filter stage, this input filter. And that, uh, that helps to get some additional rejection of out-of-band signals before you get to the phase sensitive detector. Um, you just really need to look at the, the user manual for the lock-in to understand the different ways you can set the input filter. Um, it's modeled after the PAR-124 input filter, so if you're familiar with that, it's the same. Um, when would you want to use an analog lock-in as opposed to a DSP lock-in amplifier? Um, 
usually in low temperature experiments, particularly if you're extremely sensitive to the possibility of far out of band RF noise coming from digital electronics, so like your CPU that's running inside of an SRA30, uh, the way this lock-in works or the PAR124, there is no CPU running when you're making your measurements. It's all just analog electronics, so there is no clock noise going on. Uh, this also has a very quiet front end, so the input amplifiers are a little bit quieter. Uh, and then finally, this is probably less important here, but uh, if you're using a lock-in in some kind of feedback system where latency is important, an analog lock-in can actually do better than a digital lock-in because there's no quantization artifact. There's, you don't have the, the pipeline delay of going through an A to D and a D to A converter. One piece of advice for, for using the, uh, the analog lock-in, use the analog output. Uh, this is gonna be your quietest way to measure the output from your SR124. You can read the answer remotely, but when you do that, that wakes up the CPU and generates this very clock noise that you're trying to avoid by using the, the analog lock-in. So the best way to read out the outputs are to take a BNC cable from the analog output bring that to some benchtop multimeter from Keithley or Keysight or whoever you like, uh, and then read that out where you, you bring that BNC cable through a pie filter coming out of your Faraday room. Uh, okay, a few other special tricks. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about DC biasing, but the newer lock and amplifiers allow you to add a DC offset to the sine wave output. Uh, this can be useful if you're doing transport measurements uh, historically, everyone had to make a little bias box that they'd add DC to the sine wave. Um, uh, we're trying to help you out by, by adding that. A differential sine wave output is also a new feature on, on some newer lock-ins. Uh, if you have significant ground noise, you can do, and I'm gonna talk a little bit later this morning about uh, noise and differential measurements. Uh, you can often get 20 to 40 dB additional rejection from common mode noise by making measurement differential. Uh, that's just sort of a rule of thumb, but if you're able to arrange your experiment differentially, use the, si the differential sine wave out by all means. Uh, scanning of parameters is handy to do very quick experiments without having to write a lot of code. And then this last one, I'm gonna show you an example of doing double modulation. So I've been looking around for some real example of, of this. Uh, this comes from this paper from 2007, looking at a 2D electron gas um, and something called valley splitting, which I'm not sure what it, what it is, but I understand what the measurement was. Um, so this, this feature here from the paper is a classic Hall bar. So current is being driven from this terminal to this terminal at 701.3 hertz. Uh, that's being driven by this lock and amplifier, or this lock and amplifier is tracking, uh, tracking that frequency. And then this lock and measures a signal that's called RXX, uh, is measuring the longitudinal resistance here. Then a second lock and amplifier is running an internal mode at 5.7 hertz and it's modulating an RF source that's going to turn on and off and bathe the sample with some gigahertz radiation and they're gonna look for how that modulates the RXX, creating a signal called delta RXX. And I'm gonna look a little bit at what this looks like uh, in the in the frequency domain and, and talk about the measurement. So uh, I don't have the raw data from the experiment, so I made something that I tried to uh, mock up some data to simulate the experiment. So I'm imagining this running at 701 hertz and this running at six hertz. And looking at the paper, the delta R signal was about a part in 10 of the four of the main RXX signal. And so putting those things together, you get something that looks like this at the input to the first lock-in. So I imagine some noise and imagine some one over F, uh, but here's our RXX signal up at, uh, I'm imagining it's uh, 100 microvolts uh, at the point that's measured at the lock-in. And then down here, four orders of magnitude down are the two side bands that are introduced by that second modulation. Zooming in, you can see them a little better here. Uh, this is offset by plus or minus six hertz. Okay. So now I'm gonna run the lock and amplifier at the original frequency. And so that VXX signal is now shifted down to DC. Here, 
six hertz off is our little amps we're trying to find. This is the one over FME and the, the DC noise. We could filter out all that extra noise and get a signal here. I'm just zoomed in a little bit showing, so this is the output from the first lock-in amplifier that's gonna be fed to the second lock-in amplifier. And there's this little signal here at six hertz that's a factor of 10,000 down from this output. And you can do the measurement and get an answer, uh, which is what they did in that paper. Um, but it's hard. Uh, and I'm gonna show now a different way to try to do the same. And so why is this hard? The reason this is hard is you're counting on the output stage of that first amplifier to be stable over uh, four orders of magnitude, uh, which is can be done, but it's hard. You're also hoping that there's no uh, influence down here uh, on the output from the second chopping going on. You could also arrange to do this with one lock-in instead of two if you lock to the difference frequency or the beat frequency of between the 701 hertz and the six hertz. And that's what I'm showing here. Uh, newer lock and amplifiers let you do this in something called dual mode. And now, so this is looking at the output of a phase sensitive detector that's locking at the difference frequency. And I'm gonna zoom in here. Now you can see here's our delta RXX. And the thing we're trying to reject, which was the main RXX up here, which is 10,000 times larger is offset by six hertz. And now we could ask the normal low pass filters at a lock-in to help give us this and separate that. And there's an example of this filtering it out with a one second 24 uh, dB per octave or four pole RC filter, which is nothing extraordinary for a lock-in. And you'd get a, a better than a, you know, 200 to one uh, signal to noise on that measurement. And <coughs> I'll just leave up, actually this is, uh, are they all gonna get a copy of, okay, so, so I'm not gonna actually walk through this, but you'll have this for reference. Um, it's just uh, settling times for filters and equivalent noise bandwidth, we'll talk about that a little bit in the next talk for the different filters on the lock-in. Um, so I guess we have a few minutes yeah. before break, if, if, if anyone has any questions on any of that. Actually, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Ah, yeah. Um, so, the so there's a big difference between SR560 and SR570. Um, you'd use an SR570 if you're trying to measure a current signal. So that I already mentioned, uh, you almost certainly want to use that instead of trying to go directly to the lock and amplifier unless you can have your sensor very close to the, to the lock-in. Uh, using the 560, uh, there's a handful of reasons why you'd want to use do that. One is if, uh, if the cabling is coming directly from your cryostat and it's not at low impedance already. So if, if even kilo ohms of source impedance, it's probably good to, to at least buffer it with some kind of amplifier, preamplifier, before you then bring it over to the lock-in. You could also get more isolation between your experiment and any noise that might be coming from the lock-in, especially a digital lock-in like the 830. Uh, that's a little less important if you're using an SR-124. Uh, but it's still true that uh, the added cable capacitance just in, in spanning the room from the, your, your breakout box to the lock-in uh, will load the signal. And so you can get rid of that loading with the preamplifier. Uh, finally, you could add uh, add more gain if you have a very low signal and you're worried about pickup on the way to the lock amplifier. You can use a lock in for that, uh, a preamplifier for that. The SR560 and 570 also, you can run them on their internal batteries. And so if you're struggling with ground loops and you wanna have one more set of isolation or run your preamplifier not on power line ground, uh, you can run that way. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's a, that's a great question. And early on, people thought you didn't need both of them and they just made single phase lock-ins. Um, there's two good reasons one, why you need them. 
it's, it's often handy to have both. But you need both if measuring phase is part of your experiment, especially if phase is changing dynamically. So you can make a slow measurement of phase with a one single phase lock-in just by adjusting the phase to peak up your signal and then reading out the phase. But if phase is actually moving, if you're trying to make a measurement of the phase of an experiment, you have to have x and y. And then that arc tangent gives you the phase as a measurement. Uh, there's another reason that I really like having two phases, and that's even if your phase is perfectly stable and you get all of your signals set up in the in phase, that x measurement, y should be uh, a parallel signal that will have most, if not all, the same noise properties as your measurement, but no signal. And so you can often, if you, especially if you have any sort of a complicated analysis of the data following, if you record the x and the y data, and you go through your whole analysis pipeline with both sets of data in parallel and show that you have a, a measurement in X and then the Y has the same noise but has a null detection. That's a really compelling way to convince an audience that this complicated analysis that you've done didn't introduce the measurement you're trying to make. Uh, it can also be useful for estimating what the overall noise is in your signal without it being contaminated with signal. So those are a couple of reasons. Oh. <laughs> Scott, you want to jump in? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll chime in too on that. Um, there's a couple of things. One, magnetization measurements, both for field and mass measurements, you need the magnetization measurement. In fact, the magnetization design is controlled by the mass and y. The same with field and magnetic design is also controlled by the mass. So you need magnetization measurements. The other one is you don't have to have the same exact methodology for it. But in the large scale, what is needed there is the fact that you have to have phase in. The other two points I was going to make are this. The uh, signal phase in and the path phase in. So it's a, it's a separate amount of phase in both in the signal. Mm -hmm. So those kind of measurements where there's specific information in the measurement, in the data frame, um, show the type of experiment you're doing. A lot of people do it in two phase in and then in four phase and have a path in and have a delay in. You want to know both the, the phase in and there's phases in these that are and the phase in the y axis. So you can measure them x and y arbitrarily or just one of them and, and figure out the delay. So a lot of people measure them both and then have to have the phase in. Okay. <coughs> yeah? So um, the, the reason that I stood on this is mm -hmm. that I was doing a lot of my own research. There are particular programs Well, so um, a preamp definitely will, especially if you have, have filtering in the preamp, you'll definitely get phase shifts from it. There's, you know, a cable adds phase shifts just from propagation delay. Uh, and an active amplifier will always have some additional phase shifts. If there's a, an active filter, either low pass or high pass, that'll have even more phase shifts to it. Um, so it's not that you can or should ignore the phase, but understand that the, the amplifier is adding some additional phase shifts. If you're doing a phase sensitive measurement, like the sort of thing Scott was just describing, where you need to have a different physical interpretation for the resistive or the, the lossy term and the capacitive reactive term, then you need to actually measure what the phase shift being introduced by the preamplifier is. And you can do that with a lock-in amplifier separate from your signal. You can take, just hook up the preamplifier between the sign out of the lock-in and the input, set it at the frequency you're gonna run and the, configure the filter the way you're gonna run and see what additional phase that introduces and then offset the lock-in by that phase. Does that make, make sense? Yeah. 
on, uh, on most lock and amp cards, by the way, you shouldn't have to use a line clip. Uh, in fact, on the H65, we removed it entirely. Uh, but, yeah, Scott? Yeah, yeah. The dual. So for, yeah, yeah, no, the question, yeah, I understand the question, but let me try to res restate yeah. it. The, so suppose you want to simultaneously measure this term, but also this term. Maybe that's a normalization you need to have. Is it better to construct the experiment the way the paper showed originally, where you have two lock-ins cascaded, or have the two lock-ins in parallel where you make this measurement on one lock-in and this measurement on the second lock-in. And I think the parallel way is better. Uh, and the reason I think the parallel way is better is I know that this measurement is better. It's better to recover this sideband directly. Um, uh, bec because pulling this signal out, let me back up one or two slides. Yeah, this, this is a really hard measurement. Yeah. You're, you're now, the lock and amplifier is putting out this full scale signal and you know, this is just being represented on a few bits of the output D to A converter. Uh, it's much better to let the lock-in try to recover this signal directly and then use the second lock-in to do that. Um, if, you, uh, if you have one of the pricier uh, instruments from our Swiss competition, uh, you can do this in one box. And are you standing because it's time for our break? Yes. Okay, great, thank you.